P.G., as we all used to call him, had an abiding influence on my thought process, personally also, apart from having contributed to various fields in the development of Marxist philosophy, whether it's history, it is philosophy itself, it is culture, scientific developments and advances. There was no activity of human creativity that was outside the ambit of PG's concern, interest, and also pursuit academically and for the pursuit of knowledge. So in that sense, he was a great source of uh, a learning process, a continuous learning process in my personal life as well. And I used to meet him very often. He was, I must confess, rather fond of me, would joke with me, and we all used to mutually joke about others together, and all these things would go on. But always there used to be a sense of furthering the comprehension and understanding of everything that is around, which actually constitutes the entire basket of Marxist world outlook and philosophy. Among the many other things that P.G. did, I remember he was the one who introduced Gramsci and Gramscian thought to my generation and also to Kerala, to, to many uh, a generation, and along with the legendary EMS Nambudripad, brought out a very small publication, but very, very important publication that explained to many of us the terms that Gramsci used because of the fascist censorship at that point of time in Italy and what they actually meant and what was the purpose for Gramsci to use that. I'll return to Gramsci, but before that, when you're talking of PG and his intellectual pursuits, there's one aspect of his that I think I must uh, put on record. When he was the chairman of the Kerala Film Development Corporation. There was an international film festival held in Kerala, which he, I mean, actually made it a permanent affair now. I think you have it regularly. And the chief guest there then was the very famous, renowned Polish filmmaker. I can't pronounce his first name. <laughs> Zanusi. Zanusi, but his first name is very difficult to pronounce. And in the, the chief guest in his speech had mentioned about spiritual starvation in the communist world. I'm quoting, this is what Zanusi said. So PG was inflamed. I mean, in the sense he was the president, he was the chief guest. And he said, as the president, it would have been not normal uh, etiquette to actually get up and uh, no, counter him. But he couldn't stop himself. And he would narrate that story to me subsequently, that he had to get up and talk about the question of what is communist spirituality? What is communist spiritualism? It's not that communists are not spiritual. And those discussions, I remember, we went on continuing and kept me thinking. And eventually, after he passed away and he left us, two, three years later, when uh, the Sri Narayan Guru, Matad Shivagiri, of all people, invited me to deliver their uh, valedictory address to the 83rd festival, Pilgrim Festival. And then I developed on what that was, speaking about theistic spiritualism and atheistic spiritualism. And Sri Narayan Guru's conception of the oneness of humanity is actually a development in the area of an atheistic spiritualism, in my opinion. Sri Narayan Guru himself would neither be atheistic nor theistic in his own writings. He would not want to unruffle those feathers. But this atheistic spiritualism is actually the elevation of human consciousness to a higher level, whereby that oneness of humanity emerges that through various different faiths, every human being may pass through, including being an atheist, but eventually mingle with the ocean of hum humanity and humanism. So atheistic spirituality is the rising of human consciousness 
and the elevation of a human being to the levels of a higher level of humanism. And that higher level of humanism is perfectly possible and is achievable and is ought to be achieved under atheistic spiritualism, which is, should be a hallmark of a communist society. <coughs> now, this atheistic <coughs> spiritualism, I would feel in remembrance of Comrade uh, P.G., I mean, actually, in his uh, homage and gratitude to him for what we have learned from him, which I would say to carry this for agreement forward, this atheistic spiritualism is of a higher variety and a higher character than theistic spiritualism. Theistic spiritualism has the danger, and that we are seeing today in Modi's India, in our world. Theistic spiritualism has the danger of accepting and justifying everything retrograde in the name of religion. The other day, only last week, I was in the elections in uh, Himachal Pradesh. Coincidentally, the Chief Minister of UP was also electioneering there in, in a neighboring constituency. And he, of course, was aghast that a communist, communist win elections in Himachal Pradesh. And he was saying, how can the Dev Bhumi, the Dev Bhumi elect communists who are Asuras, you know, who are Rakshasas, how are you people electing communists? Because CPM has an MLA there and a sitting MLA, and maybe this time we may get one more. So then he went on to describe Indians as saying, in Hindi, of course, he was speaking, and he was saying that we can go hungry, we can be unemployed, but we can never forget our astha, our faith. Now, the faith is superimposed over your material existence. And therefore, defense of faith becomes the, the most important task that has to be achieved. Whether you're hungry, whether you're dying because of lack of health facilities, whether you're jobless, whether your family is suffering, all those are secondary. But the honor of our faith is the most important. This is, in a sense, theistic spiritualism also, and an expression of that. And in that sort of an expression, what you find today is the entire justification of all the miseries that are being imposed on the people. Today, the IMF has downscaled India's growth projection for 2023. The Goldman Sachs has downgraded its projection. The international agency Moody's has downgraded their production, projection, and all of them put together say it can't grow beyond 6% in 2023. Now, day in and out, we have this propaganda of saying that we are the fifth largest economy in the world. The larger the size of the country, the larger will be the size of the economy. It's only basically you don't require economics to learn economics to understand that. The more people who are doing some work, the more is the contribution to the size of the GDP. Anyway, that apart from it. And the great, now with the G20 presidency coming, G20 presidency is a rotating presidency. Every year, one of these 20 countries will become the president. India was to become the G20 president last year. At our prime minister's request, it was deferred by one year so that it can be time to end just before the 2024 elections. And for the 2024 elections, you are, you are now projecting it as though a great achievement of India to have achieved this presidency. Every single of these 20 countries will be president one year after another. Now, this sort of a projection to say that we are a great economic superpower when the actual reality of the living conditions of our people, our index, industrial production growth rate this quarter, today the figures have come out, is 1.4%. Our retail prices are for the 10th month higher than the RBI 6% ceiling. Unemployment is at the highest. The global indices this government doesn't accept, 
but they have put us in a very serious condition as far as hunger is concerned. Two-thirds of the world's poor people that were contributed last year to the growth of the poor people in the world, two-thirds have unfortunately come from India. Now this is the actual reality. But if you want to overcome or, or, or hide this truth and then project as though great things are being achieved in the country, the recourse to faith and to theistic spiritualism, so to speak, that is undertaken whereby, <coughs> whereby a sort of a false consciousness is created that here is the protector of the faith as well as a benefactor for the people. And it is that construct, exactly that construct, that PG systematically analyzed from Gramsci's prison notebooks of how that sort of a fascist mindset is actually created. And what PG did was actually to supplement, in my opinion, what is currently to be understood by us also in India, what is happening today under Modi's India, is what George Lucas, the famous Marxist uh, intellectual philosopher, had once uh, started examining. He was started examining one question, saying that the German people, the inheritors of the most progressive, rational, scientific, philosophical traditions of the 19th century. How did those who inherited this legacy, how did that people with this entire understanding of Hegel, the materialist philosophy of the entire scientific inquiry, process of scientific inquiry, how did they finally embrace Nazi ideology and accepted Hitler and fascism? Now we in India have to understand that that's exactly the process that is happening now. Why is it this blind faith, obscurantism, etc., have becoming the dominant elements of human consciousness among the large section of our people? What Lukas answers is that this is because in Germany there was a systematic, systematic destruction of reason and rationality. It is this destruction of reason and rationality that today paves the way for blind faith, for obscurantism, for superstition, to take over the process of scientific inquiry, take over the process of rational discourse. And that is the big challenge that we are facing here today. Using of the instruments of state to consolidate their control is one aspect. Misusing central agencies, misusing the positions of governors in opposition to the states, misusing all these things to interfere in order to consolidate their rule, that is one aspect of it. The other more important aspect is actually to influence the consciousness of the people and create a mindset of acceptance and that comes through an assault on reason and rationality. What we are seeing today is precisely that. Two days ago, on the, uh, using the excuse of the Constitution Day, the UGC chairman has written to the governors of the states to teach the students and to launch programs saying that India is the mother of democracy. Prime Minister had used this phrase, mother of democracy, in his Redford speech. Now to, to prove that, the UGC writes to the governors. Higher education is in the concurrent list of our Indian constitution. Nothing to do with higher education should be done without consulting the state governments. So without consulting the state governments, the UGC chairman writes to the honorable governors that in the universities in their states, this must be taught, saying that India is the mother of all democracies, and that distorting entire history, that since the Harappan period, Indus Valley civilization, 
democracy was a thriving practice in Indian societies. All this is ahistorical, unscientific, wrong, but this has to be said and is talked of the primacy of panchayats and cups, cup, cup panchayat as they call it. What are the cup panchayats doing today in North India? Leave an interfaith marriage, any intercaste marriage, both the boy and the girl are punished by death. You cannot do it. That is the democracy that they talk about, cup panchayats. But in that entire discourse, there's not one word about your uh, Varna, uh, Varna system and the caste system. Not one word of the persecution of the social injustices against the Dalits and the tribals. So there's no social disorder. It was all pure harmonious democratic order that existed since the Indus Valley civilization. And that distortion as history is to be taught now in the schools so that our younger generation are fed with this idea of saying that we always had democracy, we had equal society. And he talks about the rajas of the earlier period and their, their greatness. And by definition, a democracy is a break from the empires and the rules by kings who invoked divine sanction, sanction of the gods to justify their rule. Democracy breaks that with the concept of nation and a citizen. And a citizen is accorded equal rights. And that inequality with the caste system brings, inequality, the way the tribals are dealt with, the inequality of a class society, of class exploitation, all that is glossed over and history being thought. This is the destruction of reason and rationality and a certain point of view being implanted into the consciousness of our youth. So this is what today that has to be, that has to be countered. And that is where PG's uh, study of Gramsci is important in the sense. Gramsci brought out the concept saying that when Marx said this earlier, that as long as the ruling classes also think, they also rule through the ruling ideas. The ruling ideas are the ruling ideas of the ruling classes in every epoch. So their ideas through which they rule. Gramsci points out that this is not just the fortress from where they rule through these ideas, but there is a vast network of earthworks, your drainage systems, your works, like that in society, your caste system, your education system, your faith, your temples, your churches, your mosques, all these are places where the ideas of the ruling classes are permeated. And they generate support for the ruling class, class rule. If this has to be met, a counter hegemony has to be established. So that's why I think that counter hegemony has to rest on the shoulders of what Gramsci called the organic intellectual. The organic intellectual is at the same time an intellectual and a class warrior. Warrior for the revolution, warrior in defense of the rights of the working people, a warrior to end exploitation and for emancipation of humanity. So I would say PG actually was an organic intellectual. He was an intellectual, contributed in all fields of Marxist philosophy, as we said, but at the same time, he fought class battles on the ground, contested elections, won the elections, became a, 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 member, a member of the Legislative Assembly. So he was actually an organic intellectual in the sense, a soldier of the class struggle at the same time. And pursuing intellectual pursuits in the realm of Marxist philosophy. What is required today in order to meet this challenge of what is happening, where the Indian state is increasingly becoming the instrument of <clears throat> a corporate communal nexus, 
you heard Shashi Kumar speak, though he spoke in Malayalam. I, mean, I thought he was speaking more of the corporate control of media when he talked about the freedom of press is not being in business, the first freedom. <coughs> and then the corporate communal nexus today, today gives sanction to the entire destruction of India's constitutional order and the undermining of its independent institutions, beginning with the parliament, the judiciary, the election commission, the ED, the CBI, every one of them being misused. It provides the sanction because the corporates, the leadership of the Indian ruling classes, are today more than satisfied with the policies pursued by this government that favor their profit maximization. Never in the history of India in two years did one corporate, big corporate, rise from being somewhere in the 300th rank to become the fourth or now the second. This corporate communal nexus, along with a very pro-imperialist outlook, were requiring the support of imperialism and the Western countries, which is what will be done through the G20 presidency, opening up the Indian economy for Western capital to maximize profits. So you have pro-imperialist corporate communal nexus that is hijacking India's constitution, destroying India's constitution, hijacking its in institutions. But all this is buttressed by an attack on rationality and reason in order to create an acceptance among the minds of the people that this is the most superior rule that we can ever have. And that is how fascistic orders consolidate themselves and develop. That is what Gramsci had shown, that is what PG had from there continuously taught us. So it is this battle to establish this army of organic intellectuals. That is what is required today, amongst many other battles, to face the current challenges. And to face that, I'm so glad that this year, the <clears throat> organizers decided that Sir Andram would uh, be given the award, because apart from being a journalist and all that we heard about his achievement as a journalist, he's an organic intellectual, I mean, who sides with the working class for emancipatory objectives that we all set out ourselves to do for liberation. So I'm very happy that he's been uh, the chosen and one for this award and he's receiving this award. And I only wish the some of the Sanskrit, I mean this uh, PG Memorial Committee to continue doing the good work and to actually consolidate the process of creating this army of organic intellectuals so important today to challenge the communal fascistic mindset that is being created through the battle of ideas. Finally, historical progress, human progress is finally won through the battle of ideas backed by actual live battles on the ground. It is this battle of ideas that will have to be strengthened with the backing of actual class struggles that have to be intensified. And I'm sure in the days to come, it will be a joint effort by all of us that we'll be able to deliver this uh, very important uh, duty for all of us today, which I think it's the duty of every Indian patriot today to save India today from this fascistic, <clears throat> rapidly intolerant fascistic onslaught to save India today so that we can change India for the better in the future. And that is the duty of every Indian patriot, in my opinion, and that all of us will together join. And uh, this honor for Ram will only further strengthen his contributions in this direction. With that confidence, I take leave of you. Thank you.